This is the first chapter of the Meditations on First Philosophy by René Descartes. Descartes was writing in the early 1600s, a century after the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. Europe was in a series of massive wars of religion, and although Descartes was French and mostly a devout Catholic, enough of his views were radical that he found the Netherlands a better place to work. This period is often said to be the Dutch Golden Age. It was full of painters like Vermeer and Rembrandt, scientists like Leeuwenhoek, who developed the microscope, and Huygens, who classified the rings and moons of Saturn, mathematicians and philosophers like Descartes. It was the birthplace of capitalism and imperialism. Somehow a tiny nation on the North Sea, after declaring independence from Spain, was able to set up a republic, invented the idea of the stock market, and came to monopolize trade with Japan, Indonesia, and parts of India. Even though most of the Dutch were strict Calvinists and anti-monarchists, this is where the exiled rulers of the rest of Europe, the King of Bohemia and his wife, the Princess of England, they hid out here to avoid the revolutions against their rule back home. Their daughter, Elizabeth, the Princess of Bohemia, was herself very interested in philosophy. And after reading Descartes' Meditations on First Philosophy, she engaged in a long correspondence with him, where she was inspired by some of his work, but gave the strongest arguments against other parts of it that are still influential today. I'll link to some of these letters in the description below. Traditionally, philosophers classify the history of Western philosophy into the ancient period of Greek and Rome, the medieval period that also includes much of what we think of as the Renaissance, and the modern period. But the philosophical modern period begins in the 1600s, earlier than what many people think of as modernism in art or music or other areas. And this idea, the reason why modern philosophy is said to begin in the 1600s is often because of Descartes himself. As you'll see, Descartes' idea in these meditations on first philosophy is that we should question all authority, both the ancients and of the medieval scholars, and start afresh thinking for yourself and rejecting all the traditional ideas. And this is the origin of modernity and philosophy. The meditations on first philosophy begin with this rejection of all authority and then go through work on the nature of the mind, the body, and God, and end with his own vision of how to conduct a new science on the basis of this radical self-reliance and uh, pure reason based on geometry and mathematics. Although the church at this period had banned Galileo's work, Descartes' ideas about the solar system became popular throughout Europe and set the stage for many of the more radical ideas that would come later. Descartes' own scientific ideas are not very widely studied today because the ideas of Newton and his successors ended up being so much more successful. But Descartes' work on geometry is still influential, particularly the invention of coordinate systems and graphs of equations. And in optics, his work is also influential. And of course, in philosophy, he is said to be the origin of modern philosophy. And so here we are in the first chapter of the Meditations on First Philosophy. Uh, here I'm going to be relying on a translation of this text by Jonathan Bennett, which I will link to at earlymoderntexts.com. He often rewrites things a little bit to help clarify the structure of the argument. And on that site, you can also find another audio reading of this uh, work in case you prefer someone with a different accent. So here, first meditation on what can be called into doubt. Some years ago, I was struck by how many false things I had believed and how doubtful was the structure of beliefs that I based on them. I realized that if I wanted to establish anything in the sciences that was stable and likely to last, I needed just once in my life to demolish everything completely and start again from the foundations. It looked like an enormous task and I decided to wait until I was old enough to be sure that there was nothing to be gained from putting it off any longer. I've now delayed it for so long that I have no excuse for going on planning to do it rather than getting to work. So today I've set aside all my worries and arranged for myself a clear stretch of free time. I am here quite alone and at last I will devote myself sincerely and without holding back to demolishing my opinions. So here he is with this modernist idea of rejecting all past authority. I can do this without showing that all my beliefs are false which is probably more than I could ever imagine, manage. My reason tells me that as well as withholding assent from propositions that are obviously false, I should also withhold assent from propositions that are not completely certain and indubitable. So he's asking for an extremely high standard here. 
So all I need for the purpose of rejecting all my opinions is to find in each of them at least some reason for doubt. I can do this without going through them one by one, which would take forever. Once the foundations of a building have been undermined, the rest collapses on its own accord. So I will go straight for the basic principles on which all my former beliefs rested. So here he's giving this idea that is common in epistemology called foundationalism, that there must be some basis on which all our beliefs rest. They can't be in a circular, mutually supporting uh, uh, framework. And so he thinks if we can pull out the foundations, then we can cause ourselves to doubt everything, create new foundations, and then build a more certain knowledge. So now he begins. Whatever I've accepted until now is most true has come to me through my senses. But occasionally, I've found that they have deceived me, and it's unwise to trust completely those who have deceived us even once. So here he's giving his first argument. Sometimes I've thought I've seen something, and it turned out to be wrong. If that's happened even once, then I should always distrust anything that my senses give me. My senses are not a route to knowledge. And now in the next paragraph, he gives uh, some arguments that are given back and forth. And Jonathan Bennett has uh, written these in a uh, more helpful dialogue framework. Yet, although the senses sometimes deceive us about objects that are very small or distant, that doesn't apply to my belief that I am here, sitting by the fire, wearing a winter dressing gown, holding this piece of paper in my hands, and so on. It seems to be quite impossible to doubt beliefs like these which come from the senses. Another example, how can I doubt that these hands or this whole body are mine? To doubt such things, I would have to liken myself to brain-damaged madmen who are convinced that they are kings when really they're paupers, or say they're dressed in purple when they're naked, or that they're pumpkins or made of glass. Such people are insane, and I would be thought equally mad if I modeled myself on them. What a brilliant piece of reasoning, as if I wasn't a man who sleeps at night and often has all the same experience as well as sleep as madmen do when they're awake. Indeed, sometimes even more improbable ones. Often in my dreams, I'm convinced of just such familiar events that I'm sitting by the fire in my dressing gown when I'm in fact lying undressed in bed. So here he's saying, I don't just doubt my senses because they occasionally deceive me in distant things. It's that when I'm dreaming, I often have very ordinary thoughts that also turn out to be false. And uh, how can I tell that these ones aren't the same? Here we come back to the idea of dreaming as a source of skepticism, common in many different areas of philosophy. Yet right now, my eyes are certainly wide open when I look at this piece of paper. I shake my head and it isn't asleep. When I rub one hand against the other, I do it deliberately and I know what I'm doing. This wouldn't all happen with such clarity to someone who's asleep. Indeed, as if I didn't remember other occasions when I have been tricked by exactly similar thoughts while asleep. As I think about this more carefully, I realize there's never any reliable way of distinguishing being awake from being asleep. This discovery makes me feel dizzy, which in itself reinforces the notion that I may be asleep. So here he's given this basic outline of the dream argument for skepticism. Suppose then that I'm dreaming. It isn't true that I, with my eyes open, am moving my head and stretching out my hands. Suppose indeed that I don't even have hands or any body at all. Still, it has to be admitted that the visions that come in sleep are like paintings. They must have been made as copies of real things. So at least these general kinds of things, eyes, head, hands, and the body as a whole must be real and not imaginary. For even when painters try to depict sirens and satyrs with the most extraordinary bodies, they simply jumble up the limbs of different kinds of real animals rather than inventing natures that are completely new. So here he's giving the outlines of an argument he's going to explore more carefully in, I believe, the third meditation, that even an idea that is fictitious must come from something real, and therefore our illusions must still be guides to reality. But here he's going to question exactly how much that can be. And so he says, if they do succeed in thinking up something completely fictitious and unreal, not remotely like anything ever seen before, at least the colors used in the picture must be real. Similarly, although these general kinds of things, eyes, head, hands, and so on could be imaginary, there's no denying that certain, even simpler and more universal kinds of things are real. 
these are the elements out of which we make all our mental images of things, both the true and the false ones. These simpler and more universal kinds include body and extension, the shape of extended things, their quantity, size, and number, the places things can be in, the time through which they can last, and so on. So here he's coming to the idea that although we can doubt the things that are given to us by our senses, I could imagine that I am a being that has no such thing as a body that is just dreaming my entire life. I can't imagine that. But even so, I still think that colors, shapes, sizes, things like that must be real. And early modern philosophers like Descartes often classify things like color and sound and touch as these secondary qualities that they still think have some questioning to them. Whereas there's these primary qualities, things like shape and size that appear in geometry and that Descartes thinks are even more foundationally certain. So he says, it seems reasonable to conclude that physics, astronomy, medicine, and all the other sciences dealing with things that have complex structures are doubtful, while arithmetic, geometry, and other studies of the simplest and most general things, whether they really exist in nature or not, contain something certain and indubitable. For whether I am awake or asleep, two plus three makes five, and a square has only four sides. It seems impossible to suspect that such obvious truths might be false. And so this is giving us a hint of what Descartes is going to try to do in the sixth meditation. In the sixth meditation, which is the final chapter of this book, he starts trying to use the basic ideas of geometry to say what the physical world must really be like, regardless of what our senses tell us. And while Cartesian physics has now largely been rejected because it's based on assumptions that we no longer accept, like the idea that matter is space and that all matter must occupy space and that they have to push each other and that pushing is the only way that objects can interact. Descartes thinks he gets that from geometry, but this is the basis of the idea he's going to come up with, that we should ignore our senses and work with reason. And that is a controversial idea in the history of philosophy, but this is Descartes' reasoning. However, first he has to go through one more obstacle. He says, I have for many years been sure that there is an all-powerful God who made me to be the sort of creature that I am. How do I know that he hasn't brought it up about that there is no earth, no sky, nothing that takes up space, no shape, no size, no place, while making sure that all these things appear to me to exist. Anyway, I sometimes think that others go wrong, even when they think they have the most perfect knowledge. So how do I know that I myself don't go wrong every time I add two and three or count the sides of a square? So he's giving us two separate arguments to doubt reason as well. First, maybe God could be misleading me and making me come to false conclusions through my reason. And second, other people are sometimes totally convinced that they've figured things out by reason and they're wrong. So why shouldn't I doubt myself? And uh, this is a thing that many modern people would many contemporary philosophers would raise as an objection to Des the ideas Descartes is eventually going to come to himself. But here he is raising it as an initial challenge to the use of reason that he's going to reject in the second chapter. Well, he says, you might say, God would not let me be deceived like that because he is said to be supremely good. But I reply, if God's goodness would stop him from letting me be deceived all the time, you would expect it to stop him from allowing me to be deceived even occasionally, yet clearly I sometimes am deceived. So this is an idea that he says, well, if God is good and perfect, why would I ever be deceived? That seems to be a problem. So maybe we should worry that God is not good and perfect. And in fact, if God is not good and perfect, maybe God is a deceiver. He's going to respond to that in chapter four, where he comes to this argument that God must be good and that deception arises because we ourselves lead ourselves into deception and God has given us the free will to do that. But here he's using this as a potential objection to reason. So he says, some people would deny the existence of such a powerful God rather than believe that everything else is uncertain. So this is another attempted response to the idea that maybe God could be a source of deception. Let us grant them for purposes of argument that there is no God and that theology is a fiction. However, and now here he's going to say why this would also lead to skepticism. You don't have to believe in an all powerful God that can make you be deceived about pure reason, he thinks. On their view, 
I am a product of fate or chance or a long chain of cause and effect. But the less powerful they make my original cause, the more likely it is that I'm so imperfect as to be deceived all the time because deception and error seem to be imperfections. That is, he says, let's grant if there is a God, that gives me one way, reason to doubt that my reason is going to lead me to truth because perhaps that God is a deceiver. And then he says, well, if there isn't a God, then things are even worse. So I should still doubt everything. Regardless of what the case is, I should doubt everything. So he says, having no answer to these arguments, I'm driven back to the position that doubts can properly be raised about any of my former beliefs. I don't reach this conclusion in a flippant or casual manner, but on the basis of powerful and well thought out reasons. So in future, if I want to discover any certainty, I must withhold my assent from these former beliefs just as carefully as I withhold it from obvious falsehoods. That is, if we want to build our knowledge on a firm foundation, we have to not use anything that has any reason for doubt. It isn't enough merely to have noticed this though. I must make an effort to remember it. My old familiar opinions keep coming back and against my will they capture my belief. It's as though they had a right to a place in my belief system as a result of long occupation in the law of custom. These habitual opinions of mine are indeed highly probable. Although they are in a sense doubtful, as I've shown, it is more reasonable to believe than to deny them. But if I go on viewing them in that light, I shall never get out of the habit of confidently assenting to them. To conquer the habit, therefore, I'd better switch right around, pretend for a while that these former opinions of mine are utterly false and imaginary. I shall do this until I have something to counterbalance the weight of old opinion and the distorting influence of habit no longer prevents me from judging correctly. However far I go in my distrustful attitude, no actual harm will come of it because my project won't affect how I act, but only how I go about acquiring knowledge. So here he's giving us the outline of his project. He wants to develop a new science of the world, a new understanding of everything. And to do that, he needs to question everything so that he can have only the firmest foundations. But he doesn't want to live the dangerous life of a skeptic who doesn't even believe that he needs to eat and drink. In life, as he acts, he's still going to act as though he believed things. But in doing philosophy, he wants to question everything. So I shall suppose that some malicious, powerful, cunning demon has done all he can to deceive me, rather than this being done by God, who is supremely good and the source of truth. I shall think that the sky, the air, the earth, colors, shapes, sounds, and all external things are merely dreams that the demon has contrived as traps for my judgment. I shall consider myself as having no hands or eyes or flesh or blood or senses, but as having falsely believed that I had all these things. I shall stubbornly persist in this train of thought, and even if I can't learn any truth, I shall at least do what I can do, which is to be on my guard against accepting any falsehoods, so that the deceiver, however powerful and cunning he may be, will be unable to affect me in the slightest. This will be hard work though, and a kind of laziness pulls me back into my old ways. Like a prisoner who dreams that he is free, starts to suspect that it is merely a dream and wants to go on dreaming rather than waking up. So I am content to slide back into my old opinions. I fear being shaken out of them because I'm afraid that my peaceful sleep may be followed by hard labor when I wake and that I shall have to struggle not in the light but in the imprisoning darkness of the problems I have raised. So here he's given himself a reason to doubt everything. And in the next chapter, he's going to give himself the first bit of a foundation to stand on, which is his famous saying, I think, therefore I am. He's going to say, even if I'm de deceived about everything, I still can't be deceived about the fact that I'm having thoughts. That's going to be his foundation. He eventually uses that to build up the idea of a God and the idea that this God is good and that our own self-deception must therefore be the product of our own free will. And then he's going to use this to say, we should guide our free will to you follow the correct rules of reasoning and only come to truth. And then he uses that to develop his physics. Turns out his physics is wrong and turns out his view of the mind is likely wrong. His view of the mind that it can exist without a body or without any hands or eyes or flesh or blood or senses. This is the thing that Princess Elizabeth most strongly reacted against in Descartes' idea. And this is one of the foundational debates of Western philosophy.